Hello, Maker. First, give yourself a pat on the back. You just took your first step in learning about electronics, design, and programming. Well done, and we are pleased you chose us. Thank you. Let's not mess around. Let's bring out the Maker in you. The APK Excel is a great kit to get started in the electronics world. Combine your soldering skills with your programming knowledge and reap the rewards. So let's get building. Go ahead and open your kit. Before we start, check out the paperback version of this make guide over at apk.com make. There you will find a table you can use to check your parts. You can also find and use the APK Excel visual parts guide to ensure that you have everything you need to get started. Missing a part? Email support at 8 with the part you're missing and your order number and we will handle the rest. Also note that at the back of the make guide you can find your part dictionary. This will guide you through each major component that you will be using when building your console. You can flick to this if you don't understand what something is slash does and it will give you a short description. Not sure the name of the part? Compare the part with the photos. Do be aware that the parts in the photos might vary slightly from your part due to changes in supplies. We highly recommend reading this before you start so you have a rough understanding of the parts you will be using, what their role is in the console and what they do. For those with the APK toolkit, go ahead and unbox your toolkit. Here you can see we are grabbing our soldering iron, our screwdriver set, our soldering iron lead, our desoldering tool, our pliers, our cutters, a roll of solder, and our soldering iron stand and cap. Before you use your soldering iron, there is one thing we need to do to allow it to turn on. We need to screw on the collet, a metal nut, held inside of the cap. Place the cap on the soldering iron, then rotate it to screw on the collet, then take off the cap. This collet must be screwed on before use, otherwise the soldering iron will not turn on. As the soldering iron we are using is a USB soldering iron, we have two different methods we can use to power the soldering iron. First thing we need to do is plug the longer pin into the back of the soldering iron, like so. The soldering iron takes a 5 volt 8 watt power supply, meaning you can use either a power bank or a phone charger to power it. Simply plug in the USB side of the lead into the source and turn it on using this silvery button. Here we can see when we press the button once, a blue LED turns on indicating that the soldering iron is on. If you go ahead and press that button again, the soldering iron will turn off. We also have the option to use a phone charger. Simply plug in the USB side into the plug adapter and then plug it into an appropriate either extension lead or wall socket. As mentioned before, press the button once and it will turn on and show a blue light. Press the button again and it will turn off and the blue light will disappear. For more information about how to solder, check out the soldering guide at apk.com slash make. Before we get started, we need to firstly disassemble the PCB and case assembly so we have access to the PCB for soldering. To do this, simply unscrew the white spaces. Once complete, you should be able to take off the PCB from the back casing assembly, like so. Next, we need to unplug the battery. To unplug the battery from the PCB, do this by holding the female PCB fitted connector with one hand while pulling on the male battery connector with the other hand. Do not pull from the wires but rather from the connector itself to not damage the battery or connections. Soldering and trimming the Pro Micro. The first thing you want to do is unpack your Pro Micro. You should get two sets of pins, these are called header pins, and a PCB board with a lot of component surface mounted onto it. This is the Pro Micro. Think of this as the motherboard of the console. Go ahead and grab your header pins and place them into the rear side of the PCB with the longer pins being pushed through the holes. Then place the Pro Micro onto the header pins with the USB facing away from you. We will then use a rubber band to secure this in place so we can solder the parts together. Next you want to grab your soldering iron and tin the bit. 
This means applying solder to the tip of the soldering iron to allow it to transfer heat to the pin faster. When soldering the Pro Micro, it is best practice to firstly solder the four corner pins first and then solder the inner pins sequentially. This reduces the chance of overheating a component. Here you can see we firstly solder the rear side pins. We then turn over the PCB and in a similar fashion tin the bit, solder the first four corner pins of the Pro Micro and then solder the inner pins like so. When soldering, you should always position the PCB in a way that is easiest to solder for you. In this case, we rotate the PCB when we solder the other side of the header pins as we do not want to solder across a component, as we might accidentally touch with the solder iron or even melt the component. Now that we soldered the Pro Micro secure in place, go ahead and take off the rubber band and grab your cutters. Be careful when positioning your cutters. You should be cutting just above the solder joint. Do not cut on the solder joint as this can pull up the surface of the PCB and damage it. Also, when you are trimming your pins, be sure to either point the cutter down when you cut it or to cover the pin with your hand. Both of these methods will stop the pin from flying out and potentially hitting your eye. Be sure to trim all of the rear side header pins. Fitting and soldering the toggle switch. Take out the toggle switch from the bag. Note that the pins may not be bent fully 90 degrees. To ensure they are bent properly, take out your pliers from your toolkit and slightly bend each individual pin until it is at a 90 degree angle. This will help the switch sit better on the PCB. Once complete, go ahead and click the switch into place on the rear side of the PCB, like so. Here you can see, because we bent the pins to a 90 degree angle, the switch sits better and flat on the PCB. If, when you fit the switch, you see a gap between the switch and the PCB, then take it back out and use pliers to bend the pins on the switch back to 90 degrees. Now flip the PCB over and solder the switch in place. Remember to tin the bit beforehand. Fitting and soldering the voltage regulator. Next, grab your voltage regulator out of the bag and place it vertically in its pins. This is outlined on the PCB. Then, using your thumb, bend the pins, pushing the regulator till it touches the PCB. Once it is touching the PCB, push the component into the pinholes to create a 90 degree bend in the pins. Do this till the hole in the regulator and the PCB roughly line up. Note that these holes are only for reference. If the regulator does not lay flat while you solder, you can clamp it down with a peg. This will allow you to solder it in place. Flip the board over to the front and solder the pins in place, remembering to tin the bit before you start soldering. Once complete, grab your cutters and cut the pins, making sure to cut above the solder joints. Also make sure of when you're cutting to point the cut down for safety reasons. Fitting and soldering the 90 degree header pins. The first thing you want to do is unpack the pins from the bag. Place the header pins in the holes underneath the Pro Micro on the rear side of the board. Be sure to place the shorter pins inside the holes. Before you solder, use blue tack to secure the pins in place and to hold them at a 90 degree angle. Once secure, flip the board over and solder the pins in place. Start by soldering the outer pins and work your way in. This will keep it secure while you solder the inner joints and allow their heat to dissipate correctly. Once complete, flip the board over and remove the blue tag. Soldering and fitting the 10K resistors. Here, we are bending the legs to allow them to be properly placed in the PCB. Here, you place your index and thumb on the resistor and bend the legs so they are square, 90 degrees, like so. Do this for all three resistors. Once complete, turn over the PCB and fit the 10K resistors in their labelled holes on the PCB. Orientation is not a problem. Please check that you are using the correct resistors and that they are being fitted inside the correct place on the board. Once fitted, push them in to secure them in place and, by holding them with your thumb, flip the board over and bend the legs with your other hand, like so. 
Once securely fitted, solder them in place. Here you can see we are rotating the PCB to get a better soldering angle. Once you finish soldering, bend the legs of the resistors back up and use your cutter to trim off the legs. It's important that after you've trimmed the resistor legs that you put them to one side as we will use these for later to solder in another component. Soldering and fitting the 1K resistors. Unpack the 1K resistors from the appropriate bags and bend the legs to allow them to be properly placed in the PCB using the same process as the 10K resistors. Each resistor needs to be soldered on different sides of the board. Here we will solder the first 1K resistor on the rear side of the board. Fit the 1K resistor in the labelled position on the rear side of the PCB. Remember orientation is not a problem. Once fitted, turn the PCB over and bend the legs to hold it in place for soldering. Solder the resistor in place. Once soldered, bend the legs of the resistors up and grab your cutters to cut the legs. Make sure to keep these legs for later as we will use them to solder in another component. Now we will flip the board over so we are on the front side. This is the second position for the second 1K resistor. Check the markings on the PCB to ensure that you are placing the resistor in the correct position. Push the resistor into place and turn the PCB over. And bend the legs of the resistor to secure it in place for soldering. Now prepare your soldering iron by turning the bit and then solder the resistor in place. As you finish soldering, bend the legs of the resistors up, grab your cutters and cut the legs. And be sure to put the legs to one side so we can use them later. Soldering and fitting the 330 ohm resistors. Before we can fit the resistors like the last resistors we need to bend the legs to allow them to fit properly into the PCB. This means grabbing them by the head and using our index and thumb to bend each leg 90 degrees or square. We then place each resistor on its labelled hole on the rear side of the PCB board like so. We then hold the resistors in place, flip the PCB over and bend the legs of the resistors to hold them in place, ready for soldering. Prepare your soldering iron by tinning the bit and then solder each resistor in place. Here you can see we are rotating the PCB so we can get a better soldering angle. Once you have finished soldering, bend the legs of the resistors up and then grab your cutters to cut each leg. Remember to put the trimmed leg to one side as we will use this later on. Fitting and soldering the 2K ohm resistor. Like the past resistors, we need to bend each leg 90 degrees to allow it to be placed inside the PCB. We then flip the PCB over and fit the resistor inside its labelled hole on the rear side of the PCB. Then turn the PCB over and secure the resistor in place by bending the legs. We then tin the bit and solder the resistor in place. Once complete, we bend the legs of the resistors up. We grab our cutters and cut the legs and making sure to put the excess trimmed legs to one side as we will use these later on. Fitting and soldering the two diodes. Here orientation is key, so make sure your PCB is facing up and the screen facing yourself. Here you can see that the white outline on the PCB, also known as the silkscreen, must match the black band on the diode.
Before we fit the diode, we need to bend each of its legs to 90 degrees so we can fit it inside the PCB. And once fitted, you'll notice that the black band on the diode is matching with the white outline on the PCB, but it is also on the left side of the PCB where the D-pad is, if that helps you orientate the diode. It's important that both diodes are facing away from the Promark code shown here. Push the diodes into the PCB, hold the diodes in place and then flip the PCB over, then bend the diodes legs to secure them in place ready for soldering. Tin the bit of the soldering iron so we can start soldering and then solder the diodes into place. Be sure to move the PCB so you can get a better soldering angle. Once you've finished soldering, bend the legs of the resistors back up and grab your wire cutters and cut all the legs. Soldering and fitting the RGB LED. Important to orientate the LED like so, where the flat side of the LED is facing to the left and the longest pin is the second pin from the left. The longest pin is the positive pin and should line up with the plus located on the white outline on the PCB board. Before you fit the LED to the PCB, bend the positive pin outwards towards yourself and the third pin from the left away from yourself, as this will help you when lining up the pins with the holes as shown here. You should also be able to see how one side of the LED has a flat surface. This should be facing into the PCB or to the left. This tells us that the second pin from the left, or the longest pin, is the positive pin and should line up with the second hole from the left on the PCB that is marked with a white plus, as shown. Once you have the pins aligned correctly, it's important to push the LED into place so it is almost touching the PCB. Once fitted, we can turn the PCB over and bend the legs of the LED to secure it in place for soldering. Here you can see there is little to no gap between the bottom of the LED and the top surface of the PCB. Once it is secure, we can solder it in place by tinning the bit and then soldering the pins. Soldered, go ahead and bend the legs upwards and then grab your cutters to trim the legs down and make sure to keep the trimming so we can use it in later steps. fitting and soldering the buzzer. On the underside of the buzzer, you should see a plus next to a pin. If you go ahead and flip that buzzer around, you should also see a plus on the top surface of the buzzer. Here you can see we are aligning that plus with the white plus written on the PCB. Here you can see that the plus is on the right side of the PCB and buzzer. It is securely, go ahead and flip the board around and solder the buzzer in place. Once soldered, go ahead and grab your cutters and trip the legs down to the solder joints. When cutting, make sure to cover the cut with your hand. Fitting and soldering the 22 UF capacitors. Here we can see we have a long and short leg. The long leg should align with the white positive sign on the PCB. We can also see a pattern on the capacitor above the negative bin. This pattern should be facing towards you when you fit the capacitor. You can see that the longest leg goes into the furthest hole to you and the shortest leg goes into the closest hole to you with the pattern facing towards you. Once more we can see that same pattern on the capacitor above the shortest leg. This pattern should be facing towards you. So now we can go ahead and put that on our PCB with the longer leg on the furthest hole and the shorter leg in the closest hole. Here you can see both patterns are facing towards us and that's how we know that we have put these capacitors in the correct position. Now we can go ahead and turn the PCB around and fix the capacitors in the place by bending the legs. Once the capacitors are secure, we can go ahead and tin the bit and then solder the capacitors in. Remember, it's very useful to align the PCB 
for the best soldering orientation like we did here as this can be quite a tedious soldering joint. As the two pins are quite close make sure to check these soldering joints to ensure there's no bridging and that is where the solder joints would join together and there would be a bit of solder joining them together. Once soldered go ahead and bend the legs up on the capacitors, grab your cutters and trim the legs down to the solder joints. Fitting and soldering the 104 capacitor. For this capacitor, orientation is not a problem. We can go ahead and fit the capacitor on the rear side of the PCB board in its labelled position, like so. Once fitted, we can flip the PCB over and we can bend the legs to secure the capacitor ready for soldering. Once secured, we can flip the PCB over, tin the bit of the soldering iron and solder the capacitor in place. Once soldered, we can bend the legs of the capacitor up, grab our cutters and trim the legs down to the solder joints. Fitting and soldering the dip. Next we unpack the dip. This is where we plug in our memory chip. The important thing to notice here is that the groove on the dip must align with the white outline on the PCB on the rear side, as shown here. Here we are slightly bending some of the pins on the dip to make sure they are vertical so we can place the dip with ease into the PCB. Once the dip is fitted, we can flip the PCB over they don't poke through a lot, we still bend two of the pins to ensure that the dip is properly connected and secured to the PCD before we solder it in. Here you can see we are bending the two outer corners to ensure that the dip is properly secured. This also reduces the space between the dip and the top of the PCB board as shown here. Now that we're ready to solder, we tin the bit and we solder each individual pin. As the pins are so short, we do not need to trim these. Fitting and soldering the buttons. To solder the buttons, we must firstly solder the reset button. To do this, pick up the only button with an extruded slash tool shaft. Place it in the reset button hole on the left side of the console. Then firmly press down to push the button into the position. Do not push too hard as it could bend the button legs. It's important to solder the buttons flat, so check that your buttons are pressed up against the PCB before you solder them. A good idea is to press your button a couple times to push it down into the PCB. Once the button is fitted securely, flip the PCB board over and solder the button in place. It's especially important for this solder joint to orientate the PCB to get the best soldering orientation as this can be quite a challenging part to solder as it is very close to the JST connector. If the pins or the buttons poke through too much, then use your cutters to trim them shorter. Next we need to start soldering in the other buttons. We do this by using the same process as the first button, which is by pushing the button into place, flipping the board over and soldering the pins in. It's important to fit and solder the buttons one by one to ensure they are fitted securely and laid flat against the PCB. Here you can see how we orientate the PCB to ensure that we aren't soldering over the JSD connector as that could melt and damage the connector. Each button should follow the same procedure. 1. Fit the button in the correct position. 2. Push or use tweezers to guide the button into place. 3. Turn the PCB over and solder the joints. 4. If the button pins point out a lot, trim them to shorten them. Repeat this for all the buttons, one by one, and make sure the buttons are soldered in flat.
fitting and soldering the battery management system. Unpack the battery management system from the bag. You should also get some header pins in the bag, but we will not be using these. This is where the resistor legs that we put to one side come in handy. Go ahead and place the battery protection board in its outline position on the PCB. Note that the USB connector should be facing outwards of the PCB, like so. Using the trimmed resistor legs from before, place them in the four outer holes on the protection board as seen here. Here you can see we are bending the pins to help secure the battery system in place so then when we solder it, it doesn't keep moving around, like so. Go ahead and fit and bend all of the legs on the battery system board so that it is secure so we can then solder all the pins in place. Once all of the legs are securely bent 90 degrees on both sides, we use tweezers to adjust the pin to help with our soldering orientation so we can get a better angle when we solder. Note that this is quite a tedious soldering joint so please take your time. Here you can see we are soldering the first joint. Note that we shift the PCB to get a better soldering angle so we are not soldering over any boards because we don't want to risk burning or melting any components. Be careful when soldering the front pins on the board. Do not bridge the pins with the USB connector pads as this can cause the board to not work. Please take your time, apply minimal solder to ensure the pads do not bridge and check your solder joints afterwards. It's important to note that the soldering iron is coming in at a quite a steep angle as we do not want to come at a low angle to risk burning or melting any component on the board. Here you can see the one of the pins fell down a bit so we are just moving it back up with our tweezers so we can get in with the soldering iron to then solder it in place. more the soldering iron is at a very steep angle we apply a little bit of solder and then we pull away and with that joint is soldered once all the pins are soldered go ahead and flip the PCB over and bend all of the pins upwards so that it is easier to solder now we can solder the rear side pins firstly we tin the bit of the soldering iron and then go ahead and apply a little bit of soldering to each pin and solder them in place. Once fully soldered, we can go ahead and bend the pins upwards, grab our cutters and trim them down to the soldering joint. And then we can flip the PCB round, bend the pins upwards once more and grab our cutters to trim them down to the solder joint again. Fitting the memory chip into the dip. Here you can see we have the same grooves that we found on the dip and the white outline on the PCB on the memory chip. Make sure when you put the memory chip inside of the dip that these are aligned. Here you can see we're having trouble placing the memory chip onto the dip. This is because the pins on the memory chip are slanted and therefore won't align and fit inside the dip. To fix this, we need a hard surface. Here we are pushing the memory chip pins back into a 90 degree square position. We do this for both sides of the pins to help the memory chip fit inside the dip. Now, aligning the grooves on the memory chip and the dip, we can place the memory chip in the dip with a firm press, like so. It's important not to force the memory chip in as we do not want to break both the dip or the memory chip as these can be quite delicate. Fitting and soldering the screen. Firstly, take your header pins and place the long side of the header pins into the holes on the front of the PCB, as you can see here. Do not solder this in yet. Now we are going to need our black nylon screws and white 4mm spacers. Then take your screen and nylon screws and push the screws through so the thread is pointing out on the bottom side of the screen where you can see the ribbon, as you can see here. Then secure the bolts in place with the 4mm white spacers, as shown here. Go ahead and secure each screw with a spacer.
Place the screen assembly into the PCB holes, it should snap into place. Make sure to align the header pins with the holes in the screen when you fit it on. If it does not fit, loosen off the bolt on the screen to allow some movement in them. This should help you fit it. Here you can see now the header pins are secure, sandwiched in between the screen and the PCB. Secure the screen in place with the black nylon nuts. Secure them in with either your thumb or the head of the screwdriver in the screwdriver kit. Here you can see we're using the head of the screwdriver to tighten the nuts to secure the screen in place against the PCB. Do not over tighten the nuts, you should screw them in enough so you can run your finger along the nut and bolt and it should feel level. Now we can solder the header pins in place. Be sure to push the header pins down on the front side of the screen and solder them in place. Once soldered, flip the PCB over and solder the remaining header pins on the rear side of the board. Because we push the header pins as far as they can, on the top side we only need to trim the bottom pins. Go ahead and trim the pins, but be sure to cover the cut when trimming with your hand. Plugging in the battery. Firstly, flip your board so it is the rear side facing towards you. It's crucially important that the switch is switched to the right as shown here. As this will mean the unit is off so we can then plug in the battery without turning on the console. Plug the battery in the JSD connector by holding the male wire connector and pushing it inside the female connector mounted on the PCB. There is only one way the connector can go in so if it does not fit, turn the cable around and try again. Do not force it in. Assembling the case of the console. Firstly, we must prepare the acrylic covers by peeling off the brown paper that protects them. Once finished, we must firstly disassemble the back panel assembly by unscrewing the 6mm white spaces. We do this by firstly using pliers to loosen up these 6mm spaces and then just unscrewing them with our fingers. Once disassembled, we can begin on the left and right sub-assemblies. Ensuring that the casing matches up, we place 20mm bolts through the screw holes on either side of the left casing and tighten them up with 6mm spaces like so. It's worth firstly placing the acrylic cover on the XL to ensure you have the correct orientation and then screwing on the 20mm spaces. Here you can see what the final assembly should look like. Following a similar method, place the 20mm bolts into the acrylic casing, turn it over and secure them in place using the 6mm white spaces. This is what the final assembly should look like. Now that we have both sub-assemblies ready, we can begin placing on the button caps. Troll button's button caps simply push on by pressing the button cap onto the button. To put the button caps on, simply press down on the button with the button cap and it should clip on. Make sure to get the correct orientation, otherwise you could risk pressing down on a button too hard and breaking the button. We say a button is the only button that doesn't just clip on. This cap just simply falls on the button, like so. Now we can slot the left's acrylic panel in place, turn the PCB over and secure it in place with white 6mm spaces, like so. Once you fit a cover, press the buttons to make sure that all the buttons are clickable. 
The button isn't clickable, then you might have screwed on the case either too tight or it might be misaligned. Go ahead and unscrew or loosen up the spaces on the rear side and realign it. Here you can see we are placing on the right side acrylic panel, aligning it with the buttons, flipping the PCB over and screwing on the 6mm white spaces like so. And then we are clicking the buttons, all of the buttons, to make sure they're all clickable. Then place the back panel onto the PCB assembly by aligning it with the four holes. When aligning it, you should notice that one side of the back panel still has the brown paper on. This should be facing upward. You should also notice that there is a square cut out on the back panel. This should align with the memory chip. It's important when aligning it that the battery is plugged in and that the wires are pushed in with either your finger or tweezers. Here you can see we are doing some wire management by firstly twisting the wire and then pushing it deeper into the casing assembly, like so. It can be useful to use tweezers to grab the wire and push it deeper into the case assembly. Finally, we can peel off the paper that protects the back panel. Now we want to use silver nuts to secure the whole assembly in place. Here we can see we firstly use our fingers to tighten the nuts to the assembly and then we use the head of the screwdriver in the screwdriver kit to tighten the nuts on the whole assembly. Finally we use our tweezers to peel off the protective paper that is on the screen, like so. Turning on your new console. Now, by turning the switch to the right, we can turn on the console and navigate to the hardware test, which is found under APK Maintenance, Hardware Test. Go ahead and click on it. This program will test each individual component. It will test all of the buttons, the buzzer, the LED, and the screen. It's crucial to run this after you've made your console. Congratulations on making your first ever console. Whew, you made it to the end. Take a moment to appreciate what you have built. You've brought out the maker in you. Are you ready to bring out the gamer in you? Go ahead and turn on your Excel on by sliding the switch to the right. You can check out the ABK Excel make guide found at abk.com make for more information regarding how to charge your console. Charging, you can use a power adapter or a wall plug. Next, you want to plug the connector into the bottom USB connector, the one below the memory chip, as shown here. This is where you would charge your console. For better charging, we advise that you turn off the unit and allow the unit to charge. While the unit is charging, there will be a red light. When the unit is fully charged, the red light will turn to green. Next steps. The world is at your feet. You have your very own self-built handheld console. Head on over to apk.com slash game to download the games for your console and start playing. Once you've burned through the hundreds of games available, you'll be wanting to know how they work, right? For that, you can go to apk.com slash learn to learn about your console and start programming your own games. Be sure to also check out apk.com slash make, where you can find the make guide for this, where you can find a written tutorial for the whole process. In that, you'll also find a part dictionary, which goes over all of the parts involved in making your ABK Excel and the theory behind it. A lot of things can go wrong with a DIY product. Check out the abk.com slash make section to find the troubleshoot section that will guide you through common issues that you might have. If your problem doesn't seem to be covered slash you tried the fix but it did not work, then do the following. 1. Firstly, check your overall assembly to ensure that there are no short circuits, bridging, soldering joints, or damages from the assembly process. 2. Email support at apk.com with your order number, issue, and photos to help us understand what your problem is so we can work with you to make a fix. Step 3. Sit tight and wait for us to respond ASAP. Thank you kindly for your support and patience. We hope nothing goes wrong, but if it does, we are here to help you out. Thank you. We at 8 Kid love seeing what all you makers have achieved. Send in a photo of you and your new console and we will share it with the rest of the 8 Bit Caders. 
Join the community and find us at 8 edu on Instagram or at 8 on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you so much for watching. This has been Jack Daly from 8 Keep making.